So got the whole gang in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think y'all all know everybody, but we've got Sophia McCusker, who's in our um, nursery. She gets the, the first chance to kill the plants uh, just, that we had. Uh, I was just evaluating which of these I've killed already. Well, none of these. I, um, I think I think they're pretty good. Pretty good. Okay, I approve of these. Good. <laughs> Tim Alderton, our horticulturist. Greg Page, director of horticulture. Um, between uh, the four of us, we have killed uh, oh, about boy. as many plants as you can. And I brought plants up here. I just pulled out some plants. I know a few other things were pulled out as well. Um, but we'll we'll all talk about whichever plants. Um, move us and uh you know there's a few of these plants that are perennials that i cannot seem to keep alive uh so when we get to those uh i'll let you know somebody else may be able to keep them alive who wants to start tim <laughs> okay that's fine um, so uh, for me you didn't have any sages originally and there's um i will move this out temporarily in the comments tim tim did have had he had things so. to say about my sages in the nursery because he was like, oh, well, those are blooming in the garden. Yeah, I have from the garden. <laughs> like these are all from the garden this morning in salvias. There's so many of them. Um, most of these are uh, actually these are all in one group of salvias, more or less the shrubby ones. Um, salvia gregii and microphyllas. Those are some of uh, the longest flowering uh, perennials or sub shrubs that we grow here in the garden. There's actually some just down the border from us here and probably there might be one ready to attack me right behind me. Yeah. And it's not quite in flower, but it will be shortly. And these aren't supposed to, these are, I laugh because they're often called autumn sages. <laughs> What's today's date? What, what did he celebrate yesterday, kind of? First thing, First thing is spring. And yeah, these are all in flower uh, and ahead of schedule for this year, I think. But there, these are just one small group of salvias. There's tons of other salvias. If you, can, if you kill these salvias, there's other salvias that you, I'm sure you can grow. These will actually take it very um, dry for the most part, but they'll grow in our average soil here. Don't need irrigation once they're established. Uh, they're great in that sense, but there's other salvias that want a little bit more moisture and it'll take that irrigated bed you have in your yard that, that doesn't have any different uh, watering scheme from the lawn that you have. And uh, these wouldn't like that, but... Um, there's some that would survive, no problem. There's some that take sun. There's some that take shade. There's something to fill all the, uh, the aspects. Then I have these. This is um, salvia blue by you. I often poo-poo some of the salvia <laughs> numerosa types, uh, but this is one that really impressed me in our trials last year. And I have it in a, a couple of spots in the garden already too. Um, but this is a salvia numerosa pretensis hybrid. And I've done a, a little bit of deadheading to it. I have it at the far end of this border and I have it at the rose garden and um it they were i mean they're flowering already in the garden they were flowering in january they in were flowering in, in moonlight they were in full flower uh i just did a couple i mean i i, I deadheaded them like twice to the season and i got wonderful flowering from them uh some of the straight numerosas and superba types in the past we've have had and down here anyways they're great further north but we have so many other sages it's like i just kind of discounted these and didn't worry about them but these have been great for us uh, this one, especially Blue Bayou, which is actually an All America selection too. So, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to have this one in our plant sale yeah. here in the next few weeks. It's in so. the it's in the nursery. It's so. so yeah, so our plant How's sale that? for yeah. those of you who, who want it, that is the last uh, weekend in April. But the online plant sale opens for members uh, earlier than that. I am not going to try and get you a date because. Dates don't stick in my mind. April 3rd. Perhaps. April 3rd. Maybe. Sounds about right. <laughs> our, our plant sale will open. And there's actually, besides this, there's a few things that I pulled from mm -hmm. plant sale um, areas in the, in, in the nursery. Um, but that's only for members on April 3rd. That's online sales. We do not ship plants. You'll have to pick them up here. And then the following Monday for non-members. Uh, so anybody who hears um, about some plants that they like, you may, in fact, be able to get them. And some of these will be available 
uh, in June at our auction, our Southeastern Plant Symposium auction. I know this I dug out of my own garden for the auction. So those look really good. Yeah, I like those are really cute. In the background, uh, you didn't see it, but we're motioning. Now, how big do these salvias get? And in particular, this salvia blue by you is about 15 inches or so, 12 to 15 inches. Uh, and some of the greggy eyes are about two feet. Well, there's other salvias that only get six inches tall. Then others don't get four to six feet tall. So again, if you kill one of them, there's uh, another one to try. And there's another one that'll fill a void that you have in your landscape, I'm sure. Yeah. The color palette that the Greggy eyes come in is what I like about them. And there's even pale yellows. I don't have yeah, any of those in the garden I mean, right now in flower. But if there's a color you like, chances are it grows. It, it, it comes in that that particular plant package. Um, from white, I mean, just the amount of color that he got today. I didn't keep track of which ones I picked, unfortunately, because I have so many of them. Now, if you do want to kill those, plant them in shade. Or water them excessively. Water them excessively. That's that's how you're going to kill them. And really, the only care I ever give mine is, uh, I don't like to cut them during the winter, really. But um, once they get through this, the first big flush of flowering in the spring, it's always difficult because you're going to cut off flowers if you trim them, mm -hmm. but I give it a light trim. Um, you don't want to cut back real deep in there, but if you give it a light trim, Chelsea that just chop. keeps them. The Chelsea the chop. Chelsea yep. chop. Uh, that's where you cut it back so that it looks really good for Chelsea Flower Show um, in May. And great for pollinators and yes. humming, hummingbirds. hummingbirds. Love them, especially, like I said, these are starting to come into flower now. The hummingbirds should be here any day now, I'm guessing. Tends to be in our area late, I think, late March I've, and early I've had April. Them in my house. Okay. Yep. So um, another plant I have in my little section here is some, and have the, I think they showed my first section of my native plant talk. This is uh, one of the natives I talked about. This is the Phlox Navalis uh, that I collected. It's, I just call it near white for now, but um, uh, this is flowering. I have this on our rooftop garden and it, on the, in the scree. It doesn't get water there much unless I take pity on it on a 95 degree day uh, where it rains. Um, so um, super hardy plant. Again, uh, this is native to North Carolina. I collected this in I believe Chatham County. So, but there's other flocks. This is a, an interspecific flocks here that we're actually having in our plant cell. This is one of the uh, bedazzled pink here. This is a little hybrid creeping flocks, which is kind of cool. But any of the flocks subulatus, and again, there's a flocks, a flocks are uh, uh, all but one species is native to North America. So it's a, a, a native um, and they range from the highest mountains in the Western uh, United States and Canada down to um, sea level. So there's, again, something that's going to fill a, a gap and even you can't kill them all. That's right. Well, and the, the, these creeping flocks, the moss type flocks, we use those in our flowering lawn. Yep. And they go great there. We use them in back home. I, I'm speaking of flowering lawn. We, I would see them on the sem old cemeteries where they get cut with by the lawnmower and they just persist there for decades and decades and decades. Well, in my youth as a plant snob, before I realized that a good plant is one that doesn't die. Yeah. Um, you know, I was I was learning plants and I was working in a nursery and, you know, out in the country, in the mountains, they plant this all like kind of the house is out, the 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 property's out and then it goes yeah. down to the road and, and there are always a roads there near the top and they plant this there and it's beautiful in the spring. And I kind of turn my nose up and say, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a redneck plant or something like that. Now I'm like, I can't find enough places in my garden to put it because um they're just so reliable and so so great for early spring. All right, who's next? Me? All right. Well, since I mentioned this plant, I will talk about it. Um, I do love me some variegated plants. This is Circium japonicum shiro fukurin fu. I wanted to make sure I got all that right. Fukurin in the cultivar name, that means uh, it's got a margin on it. That's Japanese word for, for having a, a variegated margin. So Circium japonicum is a thistle. It's not a very pretty thistle. <laughs> It's, but it's a thistle. It's got thistle flowers. It's kind of uh, a little bit it. spiny, but this is beautifully variegated. Uh, and the thing with the thistle, they have great uh, evergreen rosettes of leaves. So this is beautiful and variegated all winter long. I have it um, in a spot that it gets pretty good sun, but not full sun. And it's in actually pretty bad soil, uh, pretty heavy soil. And it'll put up a stalk about 
two, three feet tall, often flops with a thistle flower, uh, purplish thistle flower on the top. I don't like it when it starts to flower. So once it starts going up, I whack it back, um, whack the whole flower off, and that just makes it offset more. So now I've got a nice big patch of this. Um, and during the course of the season, the leaves will get um, pretty nice and long. So it's just like this beautiful variegated starfish on the ground. You can let it flower. I've done that before. Um, it'll probably be a little bit shorter lived if you do that. But um, if you just keep cutting it back, uh, it, it's, it does uh, fantastic. And I just went by and ripped out a couple of little rosettes and do what I often do and brought them in and said, here, Sophia. I left them in a paper bag on a table with a note to my hoodie. <laughs> Trade secrets. <laughs> they don't need. They don't need to know about me clipping things to your unworn, cl not not clothes you're wearing, but clothes that are in the office or what I write notes on and Trade things secrets. like that. Um, but a really cool plant. This is this will be at our auction at the Southeastern Plant Symposium. So that's a division, it's not a seedling. This is a division. All right. How about you? What do you like? Oh, you picked these out. I don't I know. Why. Who put me? Out? I don't like. I don't like this end. <laughs> is there anything hand. you like down here? Uh, I like the clematis. Go ahead. The clematis is cool. Uh, it is, uh, this is Stand By Me Pink. Um, I like it because it is a uh, shorter, it's it's not a vining clematis. It's more of a stand stands up, right? Um, last year we had purple, Stand By Me Purple in our sale. And this year uh, I saw pink on availability and I was like, yes, please, because it grows. This is this is habit. What's How tall is that one? 38 to 42 inches. Uh, and it's just a really pretty um, clematis. I love the seed heads. This one this goes to seed. Yeah. Yes. So I kind of feel like this is pandering a little bit. You talking about how much you like it and getting these because these these smaller flowered clematis are like my favorites. Um, and I, I I don't think you can kill them. They're the, the, I've killed a lot of the vining ones. Yeah. I've never tried to kill them. Um, I feel like the deer would eat this, and so I have, don't have any in my yard right now. I've planted some in my other places. Deer don't bother mine. <laughs> and what I like with this, this you can have... Get one now. You can, it can kind of creep around <laughs> other things a bit. Yeah. Or what I do is I'll take a low shrub or something like them little sub shrubby um, uh, salvias and just kind of plant this kind of near it, kind of under it, and it'll just go up through it and flower and be beautiful on top of there. And these little, you know, little pagoda like uh, flowers. I think I, I probably have 10, 15 of the little small flowered. Um, I love the seed heads. Like the little flowers are really pretty, but then the seed heads look like something out of Dr. Seuss. And if you're ever concerned about what to do with your uh, clematis in terms of pruning them back, cutting them back, this type in the winter, just cut them completely back. You don't have to worry about it. That way you don't have to deal with. Uh, you might even be able to do it in midsummer. One, two, two three. Flush. You, you could get a second flush on them. You yeah. could. Yeah, I haven't. I've never tried. Like I know like Raguchi, you can give it a haircut and it'll reflower. Hmm. Game changer. Yeah. All right. And those are easier, I think, to use, again, because you don't have to have that trellis. Like you said, you can grow it through something, but it is at a size that it will somewhat stand up on its own, mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about it. So. And, roses. And, I like them at really well with roses. That's what I was going to say. In, de in defense of the ones that are climbers, that's a good companion plant to plant with roses. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of climbers are, are one-shot bloomers, and if you have something like a clematis growing up through it, that's gonna bloom at a different time of the year than the rose does. And it takes advantage of that structure already. And it really adds to the depth of what you what you have in a rose garden and that diversity, which is which is a healthy thing for the rose garden. Ours is is one of those types of rose gardens. We have lots of companion perennials in there um, to add to the diversity. Um, but in, in defense of some of those, some of those climbers, that's a great use for them and for for those too. But those are those are my favorites also. I like the size. I like the flowers that hang down. I like the colors that they come in. And they're pretty as close to low maintenance as you can get. Yeah. And average water. They like, mm -hmm. you know, kind of average garden soil. Sun, they'll take a little bit of shade, but they, they're much better with more sun. Greg, it looks like you grabbed one you like. Still yeah. Don't know where you um, found that. This is a Ridgeron, a Ridgeron, um, which cultivar meadow muffin. I was planting some Nomo areas in my, my previous job and um, Angie Clehan, who's a 
looking at North Creek perennials, North Creek nursery um, suggested this for one of those spots. And um, it just absolutely thrived in some really horrible soil, um, not a lot of supplemental irrigation. And as you can see, it's, it, they fill in really, really quickly. These flowers come up in the early spring, and it's just a carpet of this color for a for a pretty good pretty good amount of time. But a really really tough plant. Um, it's the definition of something that's hard to hard to kill, um, and also something that you kind of plant and and forget about. Um, I in turn took these and planted these in my garden in Charlotte, where things in my yard in Charlotte had to thrive on tough love. <laughs> And it also was a um, Scottish Terrier proving ground where uh, my my dog would would zip through this particular part of the yard, and this plant didn't uh, didn't skip a beat. That's not to say it's it's for human stepping, but um, it just kind of spoke to how how tough and and how well it thrived in, in in my particular garden. And what's not to love with those those flowers? It's really really pretty. And it's a native. That's another one of the ones yes. I talked about in my. Now, I think this part may have aired already. And it's actually from the clump that I talked about last week had one inflorescence up. I'm looking at it from here and it's just has a whole bunch of uh, inflorescence on it. They're shorter than this. This was growing in the greenhouse or in the a cool house. So it got a little more shade, but in full sun, they're only four to six inches tall. So, and it's, they're nice big rosettes on that same. I think it's the same cultivar. If I and even in a, it could take a little bit of shade. Yeah. Flowers better. In the I've seen it in actually in part shade in the mountains where that is native. Mine, it's actually native throughout the uh, entire state, but really higher population density in the mine in my garden. Charlotte was planted in part shade and it thrived tons of flowers. So one of the, I may have mentioned this to you when we were talking about it yesterday or some other time, one of the things I do with, um, this plant and a couple other um, low-growing plants like this, ajuga, I like to grow in containers. I always say I don't grow plants in containers. I do a little bit. I grow a, a few, I have a few containers that I grow woody plants in, um, stuff that the deer will eat and kill if it's, if I put it out too small, uh, things like that. Um, I have a rhododendron in one right now because I want to see it flower at least once. After it flowers, I'll plant it, uh, and then the deer can eat the, the buds for the rest of the time. But <laughs> One of the things I do to kind of conserve moisture in there is I always plant the the top of the pot with something else. So I've got a variegated loquat in one of the pots and it is the whole rest of the pot is um, this erigeron that's in there. And I have another one with a juga on there, but it looks nice. Um, you don't get weeds growing in there. And when it gets watered, it helps hold some of the moisture in there. And it's just a really easy um, plant to do that with. And I started with a plant probably growing in one of these little size pots, not even that big. And I had divided it and moved it. And the one thing I will say is, well, your little, Scotty uh, didn't do a number on it. My dogs have never had an issue with it. My daughter's dog, who was living with us for a while, loved it and did kill out a big patch of it in the middle. But it's all since the dog's been gone, it's grown back in. I think I've got a clump of that from here, or one that you gave me, Tim. And that's, it's gone wild in my yard. It's only, I think I planted it last year. It's yeah. one of the ones it that like- take long. It's one of the ones that like I sat on my porch for way too long. We won't talk about it. And then I stuck in the ground and then may have watered it. And my yard, my front yard has really bad deer and rabbits. And yeah. I've been impressed with it. Yeah, yeah. The rabbits have not bothered it. Rabbits, deer. All right, back to you. Okay. We may get through these. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's, um, actually, Ulstrom area. Yeah, that's a good one. This is Justin Bud here, but this was growing in the nursery, but I have this actually just down further in the border. This is a really cool one. This is Ulstrom area. And, um, Tres Ronto, I think is how you say it's uh, uh, improved is its real name, but you'll find this one as Indian, I mean, Summer Paradise Indian, oh darn, the trade name is taken off. Indian it's Indian Summer, summer Indian Summer, Summer Paradise Indian Summer. But this is um, an orange red uh, flowered Ulstromeria, you know, Peruvian lilies, uh, the, the flowers that you see on every uh, table, like at, uh, at a lot of restaurants now, they're in, they're in every bouquet nowadays. But uh, this is a really cool one for us. It's fully hardy, orange red flowers, but has dark foliage to go yeah. along with that. Yeah, and this is not showing the foliage to best No, this was again, was in the greenhouse and actually a little bit of shade keeps it from forming that dark color but um it's 
it's still, this will flower often on the entire summer, especially if you uh, deadhead it between uh, flowering. And how you deadhead them is you actually pluck the whole stem out uh, of the ground. So it doesn't hurt to cut them that way too. It gives you a longer stem. And then that encourages it to uh, throw new buds up off the stalk um, instead of cutting it at the base. It's like asparagus. Um, but anyways, I love these, these plants, and this is a compact one. There are some other ulstermarias that get a lot taller. This is about as tall as this cultivar has uh, been getting for us. And, and uh, some of the old ulstermarias used to grow the the parrot um, flower types, the yeah. citacinas. Uh, they would go crazy. I think they're beautiful, yeah. both the variegated and the green, but they would run. This doesn't run like that. And I saw this for the first time out in the West Coast and fell in love with this Indian summer. It's just, it is spectacular. I saw it at Plant. Dan's. Yeah. At, yeah. At that's Cliff. the first yeah. place I saw it was in his garden. Yeah. I think I had, we had it in the nursery at the same time, but I didn't, hadn't seen it in the garden until I was at Dan's. All right. Is it me next? Oh, Nick, well. Yeah. Before I talk about plants, I want to remind people that it, today is day of giving. And you can go to jcra.ncsu.edu and uh, give us a, a little bit of love for uh, all this midweek programming we do. Uh, $10 for all this free content for the past four years, holy cow, um, would be am amazingly helpful. All right, my next plant is this polygonatum, Zhejiang gensis. I'm glad you got so, to say that. So from Zhejiang. And really, I have. Uh, polygonatums are plants that I just, I love, I love, I love them. I don't know why. I just find them very cool. We call them woodland lilies because they are related to lilies. Um, and they grow in shade, which I have a lot of shade. Uh, I don't have any problems with deer or rabbit eating them. Every once in a while, rabbit will come through and just nip the top and it'll flop over and, and fall. This is a relatively new one um, for me to grow, but this will, if it's out in the garden uh, and gets mature, will get six to eight feet tall. It is so insanely huge um, on big chunky stems. And like I said, I haven't grown this one for very long, but I have one at my house that is evergreen. So it's gonna say, was this an evergreen or a deciduous one? This is an evergreen one. It still looks good out in my garden. Hadn't gotten six feet yet, but it is hard. You can't tell this probably, but the rhizome under here is distorting this pot yeah. here. That way? Or the one you know, it is, it's, I can feel it trying to bust through here and uh, probably another two months in this pot and it will come right through there. Um, the, the, all the polygonatums, we have some, some native ones, uh, deciduous ones, a lot of different types, but in general, they'll have, you know, upright arching stems, little white or green flowers fo followed by black fruits. And I love them all. This is not an easy one to get right now, but all the polygonatums are great. And this one looks so good in the nursery. I couldn't pass it up. I mean, look at that. That's last year's foliage and it still looks Absolutely perfect. I like just the general odoratum variegatum. Yeah. Which it, it's a wonder, it's one easy to find. And another thing, if you get too much of it, because it does propagate, it's actually nice in a salad, the rhizome in the spring. It has really? a little appley flavor to it. So it, it'd be so, a fresh salad. And that old, the old, so it's old purpose. odoratum variegatum, I probably, I'm terrible combining plants, but the, I probably have more pictures yeah. with that with hostas, with you name it, any kind of shade plant, ferns, and it's just always one of those plants that makes a great um, combination with other things. It doesn't, doesn't compete with anybody else. Now you, what do you like? You got phloxes, dianthuses? I talk about the dianthus. I don't have a ton to say other than I picked it out because it's pretty and they're one that I like. They were one, uh, when I was doing landscape work, I would always try to fit a dianthus in on the edge because I loved um I love that edge that it makes. They're pretty um I feel like you could probably kill this with water. Um, yeah. they do not, but in the garden, that means you don't have to water them a ton because they once established, they don't need a ton of water. And they just make a really pretty um clump and they spread and they're so bright and cheerful. Is that fragrant? No. Okay. This like is um this is paint the town fancy. I mean, I I would just buy this for the name. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't smell anything. Yeah, I get a little tiny. Let me see. No. 
There's a light fragrance. Let me see. Oh, it has a little bit of clove. Yeah. And I, I love a fragrance, not a dianthus, but those That's are great. The, 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 the uh, low spreading ones. It smells like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a very light one. When you get a mass of those, I'm probably guessing uh, you probably have some more fragrance. Yeah. One thing I like to do with my dianthus is shave them back um, after they finish flowering. And I just yeah. go over with the lawnmower. I don't get all precious with and that one you can do that like with that. because that one only gets yeah it gets low three to six inches and you tall. kind of shear off the top and it'll look a little bit brownish for a little bit and then it'll fluff out over that but if you never cut them back they can pile up on themselves and kind of choke themselves out over time that's another one i used to see on cemeteries back on the yep. yeah, exactly yeah. what iris is that this is, that is the, mean treasure oh yeah the big one in the little pot there but I've been really abusing that one. That one's in a very dry say, spot in the nursery. I have it in the garden down here in a couple spots. I mean, it's not dead yet, so. It's not, irises are, are pretty forgiving. Um, and I like this, I don't know much about this one. Um, I'm going to do a, a spiel, uh, wax poetic about irises in general. Um, I really like the foliage of them. Um, the Japanese uh, uh, rooftop irises are some of my favorite because of the foliage. They bloom early in the in the spring. Um, but this one has nice, clean foliage, as, as you can see. Um, these typically avoid a lot of the, the d issues you get with uh, the great big showy ones. Um, what am I thinking of? The boars. Uh, the boars that, that, that affect them um, and other things. There's some leaf-eating insects that, that rip them to pieces. But um, I, I'm blanking on the color of this one. It's I'm purple. It's purple. It. And what, so do you remember the history? The yeah, yeah, I can tell you a little one. bit about this. This is one that was just recently named Iris X Amplifora Ming Treasure. Um, it's, it's a hybrid, a naturally occurring hybrid um, found by a researcher at Shanghai Botanic Garden who um, went out with Scott McMahon and I went out with uh, a couple times uh, collecting some plants. And this is, it's interesting you say that about the roof iris, iris textorum, you like that, because this is like, it looks like a, a roof iris on steroids. Yeah. Foliage will get three feet tall. Flower stalks can get five feet tall. I've got a picture of a spent flower stalk with uh, a young man who's much older than me uh, with it up to his, his nose. Um, so it looks like a little guy in this pot, but it will get really big. I have it, it, it grows in wet areas, but I have it in the most brutally dry spot in my garden. And it, it's not getting as big as it will when it's in good soil with good moisture, but it sure isn't dying and it's mm -hmm. multiplying. It's just not living up to its full potential. Um, I have it at the other end of the border here. It's just been in for about a year. So it, it's for, the foliage right now is about that big on it. It hasn't gotten real wide yet, but um, I expect it to be flowering here in the next few weeks. Griffin wants to know how long you can expect it to mature and flower after planting. So if you plant that in a good spot, I would say next growing season, probably yeah, next growing season, maybe one other year if it was really abused. All right. Uh, gotten an update. I like getting these updates. We are up to 169 gifts uh, out of 250. That is our goal. So we're inching closer to that 250. Um, very exciting about excited about that. All right. We're going to have to keep moving because we're. God, when you get all of us together, we go slow. So yeah, um, we get real chatty. We get real chatty. So I just my next one is this little thing here. This is nothing. Is it's not a specific one. This is actually a seedling, but this is a eucomus. If you can kill a eucomus, you're really trying. I have to say, um, this is a seedling that. Uh, I I don't know if we actually if this is, might be a seedling of a seedling that was planted in the rose garden, which I need to start removing. Um, they're excellent cut flowers. They're pineapple lilies, if you aren't sure what a eucomus is. And uh, this is from seedlings that we dug up and moved into the rose garden that were from around one called Reuben. And there's various colors uh, of them, pinks and kind of greeny whites and creams. Um, some of them have more purple in the foliage, but regardless, um, of what kind of eucomus, whether uh, sparkling burgundy, which is one Tony Avent introduced decades ago, and there's some other new ones um, that come out with that same characteristic. They are almost, once established, impossible to kill. If you want to try to divide this right now, too, I, I, I dare someone to try it. <laughs> um, I gave one to a volunteer a couple weeks ago to take home, and um, he amazing. says, I tried to break it in half, and I couldn't. I had to <laughs> get something out to actually 
a, like an ax almost to get it apart. It's so, so it's I guard with a hatchet. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, they are uh, difficult to kill. They grow from leaf cuttings even, and um, so as well as seed, but um, wonderful cut flower through the summer months. So why do they spread around? Uh, for in the garden, I do get seedlings, which is not good when you're trying to keep the uh, them consistent color-wise. But um, other than that, they just divide. This was there is a, the central bulb has passed away in here. That there's five or six enormous side bulbs on this that are all united if uh, in there. So I just went and dug that out of the rose garden just before the we got over here this afternoon. So and, and the seeds scatter right around the yeah. plant there aren't like birds aren't moving no them, no they so don't spread that not, they don't it's far. all yeah like right at the base nothing eats it either rabbits don't touch it deer don't touch it so oh. all right is it me again i think yeah all right this little plant this is a hemiboea which does not have a good common name um but this is an african violet relative and people who've been listening to a lot of midweeks and things for the past year or two years have been hearing me talk about him at Bowie is quite a bit um, because I've become obsessed with a lot of these African violet guys. And we are finding that almost every one of these Hemiboeas is just rock solid in the garden. Give them some shade, give them a decent soil, and they just go on and on. Now, I've got some in some awful soil, and they're not dying. They're not thriving, but they're not dying. Um, this is one called Gracilis. Uh, Hemiboea gracilis. It's got these, I don't know, hopefully you can see that. Um, I don't know with the sun, but nice purple backs to the leaves, really dark green. This, this one in particular has stayed low. I've seen some older plants stayed fairly low and has really beautiful kind of blue lavender um, ish flowers on there. We've got some yellow flowered Hemiboeas that we're growing. Uh, most of them are white, sometimes with a uh, nice color in the throat. Um, they, they spread, they form mats, but you can pull them out real easily and hand them to friends. Um, I just, I think these things are so cool and they flower late, late in the season. So I always think it's nice to have things flowering late in the, um, in the shade garden because well, they start, some of them start as early as July. Yes. But um, I think it's, it's, great to have um something with color later in the season because so many of our shade plants are spring um flowering plants you might think that it's an african violet relative it's not that hard and you say it's hardy here yeah i uh did i uh spoke at the gesner ant society last year and they were saying it's a um a subulata right yeah um, yeah or no flux no, it's Sub, not Subacolis. Sub Sub not Subacolis, what's the other? Oh, darn, the Sub common capitata. one. Subcapitata. Subcapitata, thank you. They were growing <laughs> that up in um, New York, even in, I think oh. even Boston. Wow. Like, YouTube, so it's, it's yeah. hardier than you would expect. I don't know how hardy this gracilis is, but I can't, we don't have that one in the garden yet, and I'm really looking forward to trying that one. Um, Y'all are not mentioning the most important thing. It's Himaboeas that... Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes. The, Do you want to tell? Oh. The little, is it the seed capsule? No, it's the, is the it flower bud. bud. The flower there's, bud? The br there's bracts around the buds. Yeah, there's bracts around the buds. And if you pick them off and squeeze them, they hold, is it water? I guess it's just water. water? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But they spray like a little water gun. They do. It's like, <laughs> it's like having llamas. Yeah. Interns taught me that. Yeah, I mean, same yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if they go. The interns go around squeezing the buds on all the plants, or um... uh, it was uh, one of our students who had been an intern at Missouri Botanic Garden, and oh, he learned okay. it there. Gotcha. Yeah. Anyway, a good plant for kids. Yeah, it's Which, fun getting them introduced to horticulture with a squirt gun. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, what do you got? Me? You? Well, I guess I'll do the <laughs> the saxifrag. Saxophagma? Yep. Is this Wincliffe Silver? I think. I think so. Or Sa Saxo Saxophraga stolonifera, probably Wincliffe Silver. Yeah, you can't kill it. Uh, it's also known as uh, what strawberry begonia, mm -hmm. which is like the weird. I don't like that. Strawberry geranium too. It's just it's not weird. a begonia <laughs> or a geranium. Who does that? Um, <laughs> that confused me when I first. Uh, was ordering plants because I was like, oh, well, that sounds cool. And then I'm like, that's not even, that's none of the things that it says. It spreads by these little uh, stolons and it just keeps going. These little, they'll touch down and form a little rosette and you'll have it forever and ever. 
than ever. It makes a good house plant where further north or even yeah, here. That's, that's, that's how a, I was introduced to it. My grandmother had them. I used it in places where I it was dry, like under trees and stuff where it was dry, but they wanted some they wanted like a little bit of texture or color under there. And it would spread. It I've been hearing now more spreads. recently that they're saying zone six ish for them. Uh, but we have it in the Cascade. Actually, on the Big Falls, there's a plant. I don't know how it got on the edge of it. It has not gotten washed away. It is growing in the water on the falls. It is attaching to the rock wall. Uh, is this so in the nursery? That was in the nursery. Yeah. I got to keep better track of these plants. I thought. <laughs> you thought you sold the last one. I thought I sold them all. This one does not feel like it's been watered. No. You can't um, kill it. But yeah, you can't kill it. <laughs> and, and like Tim said, I learned this as a as a house plant as well. Um, and then when I saw it in Atlanta, when I worked there for the first time growing, and it was actually starting to creep up a tree a <laughs> little bit. And I've planted these. I've been starting to plant things in trees. So I had a tree where the the little crotch in the tree <laughs> had was you know picking up some some little uh, some moisture some duff you will there mm -hmm. and so i put it there and i'm waiting to see if it'll really take and you know hang out of the tree like that fights i'm i'm gonna pretend like i live in the tropics and like tim was saying it's it's growing on rocks in our um little waterfall out front cool stuff is that a ophiopogon or a clump of annual bluegrass no that is a <laughs> this is a, a, a chorus yeah i don't know much about that okay. all right yeah here mark you're gonna have to finish these up how about the baptisia or the farfusia see great greg, greg we got Greg here because they're an arboretum. And Greg's a woody plant guy. And then we pull him out on camera with a bunch of mushy plants. With this guy right next to me. Well, so try to keep track of time here. We still have time. All right. I could do the Baptisia. Yeah. Which one is that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I didn't even American look. Goldfinch. American Goldfinch. There are a lot of different cultivars of Baptisia. I'm going to go out on a limb and be um, a rebel and say there's too many. Um, I, I tend to lean towards the yellow ones and I'm going to go out on another limb and say American Goldfinch is a yellow one. Um, <laughs> it's a spherocarpa hybrid. <laughs> It is, it is bright purple. Bright purple? <laughs> it's the wor one of the worst names. Are no. you serious? No, I'm not serious. <laughs> no. um, it's a purple fish, the, not a goldfish. I need to talk to the naming department of proven winners. <laughs> this, this falls into the native plant realm. It's a good, it's a good perennial for, I'm going to say first time gardeners because mm -hmm. it, it is incredibly hard to kill. Um, there aren't a lot of pests that bother it. It, you know, you cut it back late winter um, the seed pods can be kind of attractive and it's super easy to to cut back a lot of times you don't even need to you can just it snaps it. right off and you can see there where it's been was attached at the base and it shoots up with reckless abandon it's already starting to form flower buds and it blooms for a, a decent amount of time um, typically there are there are purples and blues but there's there's yellow and purple ones that are mixed together. There's different shades of yellow. There's light, there's dark. I like Carolina Moonlight. That's a mm -hmm. favorite of mine. Um, a nice mound of really pretty green foliage. Very, very drought tolerant. Um, a good kind of a meadow plant or even a, a prairie kind of a thing. Um, it's great for that. It can take dry um, dry soil. It does better in, in full sun. Doesn't, doesn't do well with, with shade on it. But once it blooms, a nice green, solid orb of, of foliage. Not a lot of fall color to speak of. The seed pods are kind of a dark brown, which are kind of attractive. It's super easy to propagate from seed. Um, from a pest perspective, there is a leaf miner, uh, a webworm. The, yeah, the web, that, the, that, the little caterpillar. That, that gets on it, that's easy to take care of. If you, if you catch it early enough, just cut those pieces off. Deer don't eat it though. Deer don't eat it. I've not seen rabbit nibble on mm -hmm. it. Um, it's a really good perennial. Um, it's a good gateway perennial to get you into gardening with perennials. The only thing is you do not want to, it's not one for that person who likes to move everything around. No. It, they want to be planted and left alone. They do. They, like they'll, a they'll show you their displeasure about being moved around by breaking your shovel when you try and yeah. dig out a, yeah. a mature one. Very deep and, and heavy roots, um, but a, a really good perennial and one that um, there's there's a spot in any garden for them. I've loved watching them come up in the nursery. I love like emerging buds. Yeah. When they like start to, you know, like down at the base. Yep. The when emerging. They first, when they first come out. Yep. They're so sweet. Yeah. And one thing you can do, what I like to do is not cut it back at all 
and just let it abscise and it mm -hmm. becomes like just this big uh, uh, tumbleweed, tumbleweed, tumbleweed like and tumbleweed. it will blow into your neighbor's garden, yeah. which is yeah. perfect because their dogs come see. in my garden. I remember then when they'll I see it in there, the, then you'll be looking at white. someone else's baptisia. Yeah. That's right. Actually, I <laughs> do. I cut them back when they get the um, web worms. I'll cut them back and they hard and yeah. let them reflush. They yeah. don't usually reflower for me, but yeah. they do reflush. So, I, do That's we still have one. time, right? Yeah. Yeah, we got. We've got. Okay. Some time. So here's one. It's actually one you collected, as you know. Um, this is a Tricertus. This is Ravenii. This is one of the newer species of um, Tricertus. Probably early two th around 2000, as it yeah, recognizes yeah. a species, named after Dr. Uh, Raven, who was the director for a long time at the Missouri Botanic Gardens. Uh, really attractive spider, or, I mean, trout, or bleh, toad lily, get the right critter. Uh, <laughs> uh, the flowers for us, anywhere from, I'm gonna say, it's early sometimes, it, it's been later the last few years, but it used to be I'd get it in uh, August and September, uh, but through frost, a nice, uh, or, <clears throat> Toad lily, uh, speckled flowers, which almost look jewel-like um, when you get the light on them. And they're white with purple flecks on them pretty often. And this is a nice one. It's a, This one is a nice clumper. I mean, it, it'll form patches like this big. Um, but uh, the foliage is nice. It's I don't know if one can see it. Going back to the, the is, this is very glossy, but it has speckles on it like that of a trout lily at this time of the year in the garden um, or in the wilds around here. So anyway, it's just a really cool perennial for the shade. Um, and it's one, it's becoming a little more available, but and it's, yeah. it does great in our climate. And all the toad lilies, I kind of, they were one that ones that I felt deeply in love with and then kind of fell out of love with and I'm falling back in love with them. I haven't done anything to it since I planted it and it's still, it sustains itself. Late bloomers typically. Yeah. Yeah. Which again, in the shade garden, you don't get a lot of that, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is really nice. I love to, to you're going to trip me <laughs> up too. Toad lilies. They're one of my favorites too. They remind me of, Epi they have like are on the same, uh, they remind me of the epimedium. Yeah, you can often get the, the spotting on the leaves like yeah. that. It's a good companion for epimediums. Yeah, you yeah. get the early yeah. flowers from the epimediums yep. in the late. That's another group of plants that I kind of, I was just absolutely crazy about and then kind of they fell off my radar a little bit and are, boy, I've been yeah. really liking them this spring and I feel I've like been planting I more. I forget about them and then I'm like, oh yeah, epimediums. If you, if you want to fall in love with epimediums, step one foot into Tony's epimedium house oh, no. at Plant Delights and your checkbook will instantly start to empty. Hey, how do I how do I get there? I've not been there before. Yeah, you have. I need to go to there. <laughs> so I'm told that we are getting even closer to our goal of 250 gifts. If you go to jcra.ncsu.edu, um, you can give as a thank you to all the fantastic staff in front of and behind the cameras. Um, 250 gifts, we get a, a match from our board of $18,000. So you can give $10. Uh, if you can give $20, you can give $10 twice. Um, you know, you can give $500 if you want, but any amount is, is really, uh, really uh, appreciated. And I told everybody at the beginning, if we get to our 250 uh, gifts by six o'clock, I'm not sure if I put that caveat on last time. By six o'clock this Friday, I will wear this as a neck tattoo. And uh, we'll make sure that Blake has a photo to share next week at midweek. Um, what are uh, we, is there an event Friday or is that the day you're gonna stay home and work in your garden? <laughs> You know, casual know. Friday. When are you flying away on your next trip? <laughs> Monday. <laughs> Monday. I don't. I don't. I don't want to get mixed up with you know bad crowd in Uruguay, so I don't want to wear it there. No, definitely. We want you to come back. All right. Who wants to talk about rodeos? I think you do. I do. Yeah. How do you know? <laughs> All right, rhodias. I love rhodias. I love these plants for shade that you can't kill, that deer don't eat, that rabbits don't eat. Um, I don't have anything that eats them. Uh, this is uh, a, a cup. This is one variegated sport. Do you know? I, mm -hmm. I have to go back and look in the records to see where this to, variegated yeah. sport came from. Where the one who found it? <laughs> Me? More than likely. Twenty-one accession. Yeah. It's got to be one of us. It's got to be one of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One of y'all, probably. We have been on the air since 10 o'clock this morning. Stay tuned. <laughs>
<laughs> until six. <laughs> we will get less comprehensible as the day goes on. We promise. What are you about? We're still forming sentences. And this is Shiro Bataan. Um, you know, this variegated sport, a lot of them, you get this striping on the leaves, which is much more usual for uh, monocots, the, you know, grasses and lily family to have variegation like this. Um, but with the rhodias, you can also get this like splotched. You can get deep green, just the plain species with deep green um, leaves are amazing to me. Get them big ones, you know, they can grow to 24 inches or so. There's some species that get even larger, which stay tuned. Still trying to get my hands on some of those. Um, there are ones with little crested leaves and things that are all contorted and ridged. Um, they call them dragon uh, types because they look like the ridges on the back of a dragon because we all know what dragons really look like. But great plants. <laughs> and then they come up with kind of inconspicuous little flowers. They're, they're almost like little miniatures of the Eucomus flowers, but little oh, green yeah. guys. And then they get red fruits on there. And I do, I, I just let mine um, seed in my garden. And if they're interesting, if any of the seedlings are interesting, I'll move them somewhere else. Uh, if they're just green and I'll just put them in a big patch at the far end of my garden where the deer come first so that they can, they have something pretty to walk through um, on their way to my other plants. Um, but just this past weekend, I dug up a really great little seedling um, from Taisho. You can grow them in pots as, as container plants. I actually grow some of these in containers outside and I like them because you can grow them in really small containers like this and not worry about watering them. They're very, very drought tolerant. Uh, and But then I can leave them out in the pot all winter um, and not worry about them, you know, getting getting problems with the cold. If they get they'll get some cold damage to the leaves and you just trim off the new leaves as the, uh, the old leaves as the new leaves are coming out and they'll, they'll form new rosettes on there and you can divide them um, into single fans like this. Uh, and in the, in the garden, they really have really no problems to speak of. I love them. All right, there are some plants that, that you can't kill. I brought a couple that I keep killing so Tim can tell me that he doesn't kill them in the garden. The first one, this is actually a, a seedling from a plant that I collected with Tony Avent in Taiwan in 2008 and then collected again in 2009 in Taiwan. It is uh, Ligularia. Or uh, Farfugium. Farfugium, thank you. Farfugium japonicum variety formosanum. So the, uh, the Taiwanese form of uh, what you often see is the leopard plant with um, leaves that are spot speckled with, with gold on there. Really great plants. Uh, this is a small form of that. The Formosanum, much smaller, has kind of more angular leaves, has the same flower stalks late in the season with gold flowers. This plant, I keep killing. I don't remember if we still have that one in the garden now yep. or not. I, other than I <laughs> replanted some over there. The uh, the Aria maculatum, I had beautiful patch though in the Japanese garden, but the rabbits have like one leaf every night I would find. They wouldn't eat it, they just leave it for me on the bench, the stone bench. Oh, nice. And there's almost none, there's none left now. And that, that was during COVID it started. Yeah, yeah. And there was but no one here. The rabbits got, got the the, rabbits, rabbits are. They're jerks. They're jerks, they're thank jerks. you. It's like, Thank you for. They didn't. They would never eat it. But there's always a leaf. Or up in, now there isn't because. But I would come in almost every morning, and there'd be one leaf on one of the stone benches. This plant, yeah. I um, I just, I don't think it's rabbits in mine. I think it just. I've put it out in sun because yeah. we collected it in fairly sunny spots, but kind of in ditches. Did not like it there. I've planted it in shade. I've got another one that I purchased and planted in shade, and. It's still just puttering out. They had that at Atlanta Botanic, don't they? They use a lot of those in Maybe the not that garden. Clone, but yeah. they, they use a lot of the giganteum type cool. that really, yeah, they call it the you know, tractor seat um, yes. because it looks like a John, an old John Deere tractor, uh, tractor seat. seat. Yeah. Um, and they have in masses. Uh, I don't know if they have a deer problem, I mean a rabbit problem. They used to in the, in the vegetable garden, but yeah. I used to take care of them. Trade secrets. Trade secrets. Shh. All right, we all know my love of vines. I'm scared of I that. like this one, actually. We have a couple different species in the bath house, but they're, the volunteers don't always realize they're there and they end up pulling them out, but they come back up. So, so. this is a codonopsis. So it's a, it's 
kind of a think of a vining bellflower. bellflower. Often the flower, the flowers are, are cup shaped and often um, not real showy in terms of a lot of times they're pale yellow, pale pink, white, but often just with this incredible uh, coloration inside them. They're really, really cool. Um, they are vigorous as all get out in the wild. Tim just said our volunteers sometimes accidentally pull them in the lath house and it doesn't kill them and they come back up. I cannot keep these stupid plants alive I in saw my one garden. this morning in the lath house that I didn't really realize was there. I was ready to pull it and then, oh wait, no, that's the code and opposite. There's the label. Like, I cannot keep these <laughs> things alive. I kill them all the time. I order them from nurseries. I baby them. I ignore them. I have tried everything with these things. I plant them, you know, like they used to tell us to do with, with uh, Clematis, I plant it on the, you know, the shady side of the plant and let it grow up through there. I plant it in full shade. I plant them in full sun. I cannot keep them alive. Uh, I don't know what my problem is with them, but I keep getting seed for them. <laughs> yeah. How do you, it's like you can read my mind. <laughs> I'm like, I can grow them from seed. That's a seedling. <laughs> Sophia grows great Codenopsis from seed. I don't know if they do anything. I cannot keep them alive. The ground, but... Well, apparently they live in the lath house. I, I know of at least two right offhand that I can think of right now. Hi. Usually, because that's, that's it, one has been there for years. That's this, one of the seeds that comes right up too. Okay. This is this is a plant that I remember seeing for the first time in flower. Um, I had I had planted it. I kept it alive to flower in Atlanta, and when I saw it in flower, I was just like, "That is that's just crazy looking." The way the inside of it looked is almost psychedelic, um, but I can't keep it alive in my own garden. Do we have any questions, Blake? So Marilyn asked a while ago if uh, bulls will eat the roots of the eucomas. I don't think so, but I don't know. I don't have voles here. If they have to be really hungry and have really sharp teeth, <laughs> yeah, you know, an established one. We had voles in my garden in Charlotte, and they didn't do a lot to. Have, in the perennial beds. They're in the, it's in the hyacinthaceae, and there's yeah. not too many things that really bother things related to hyacinth. No. Yeah, I, I, I've never had any problems with it. And- um, They don't like shade, that's about all I've found. Yeah, I um, I don't think of them like I think of a lot of other bulbs that, that voles will, will mess mm -hmm. with. I, I don't even think of eucomas so much as bulbs until I go to dig them out. Yeah. <laughs> um, really, you know, because for whatever reason, some plants you think of, that's a bulb and other plants, that's a perennial where that's kind of a meaningless uh, in some ways. <laughs> <I think. laughs>